I'm Steve Hope as, um, from uh, Docabo and tonight I'm going to talk about the integrated uh, care services um, and implementing the vision that um, we've had of how we're bringing together the idea of health and care and community services. So about Docabo, many of you perhaps won't have heard of Docabo if you're not in the whole profession of uh, in this particular space. Docabo are actually a company that manufacture um, medical devices and complete end-to-end -end telehealth systems um, as we are the sort of main, um, one of the probably second supplier in the UK from uh, a telehealth supplier. But many of you probably would have heard of Tunstall because of their uh, telecare, but, they also, uh, but we also are really a telehealth supplier. But um, telehealth is about managing patients and then we also supply systems for care delivery logistics, which is about managing um, staff. And um, also, more recently, looking at the whole assisted living space, social isolation, and looking about other informal care as well. Going back, just a few um, notes about some of the products we actually um, have sort of starting what I say the most recent sort of um, back to the uh, original com uh, company. We've looked at recent, most recently a product uh, for risk stratification. Now those of you in the health, I'm talking probably to a mixed group tonight, but risk stratification um, is actually about looking to see all of the patients you have in your whole area. Um, a, PCT might have a quarter of a million patients and actually what you can do by various st uh, statistical analysis by seeing what care they've already got you actually look to see what is the potential risk for that particular patient of actually um, having some sort of uh, condition and um, and in our case, we have a particular tool for seeing whether, um, whether they might be suitable for telehealth. But it does mean that you can effectively budget in advance for different patients with different conditions. It's not just about uh, telehealth. And um, so it's all about, as I say, optimising the medicines, uh, trying to see what, um, what, uh, how a patient actually um, is in the particular area they live. All sorts of facets can be actually input um, into our tool that was developed um, in, um, in conjunction with, um, uh, with the NHS in Surrey. And so basically you have a, the, um, for different conditions you actually have effectively it's really about money what it comes down to nowadays unfortunately so how much it actually costs and what the actual all of these things have a tariff in the health service basically every condition when you put somebody forward into a hospital um, it's worth so much money a tariff for related to that and actually risk stratification helps you to try to work out your budget in the future and predict what the sort of uh, conditions might be the other tool we've also recently had um, came from our partner in Australia and in Australia our partner um, Silverchain they actually manage some uh, 3,000 odd community nurses and workers across Western Australia quite a big area and as a result there's a whole need for uh, rostering, for productivity, and, and of course there it's a different system. They actually, people pay um, for the care when they actually receive it as well. So there's invoicing and a whole sort of uh, billing system. But um, above all, um, I think one of the most interesting things is this whole idea, uh, the rostering thing, is that uh, if a, a nurse goes sick, you can automatically re-roster and actually reroute um, to the person so that they, they do the minimum miles for the maximum number of patients. In the UK, um, one of my friends in Somerset, she might suddenly, she's a community nurse, suddenly finds herself one end of Somerset doing a patient and they give her somebody else totally the other end and spends all day, 12 hours a day almost, most of it travelling and it's not ideal and puts a lot of stress on the, uh, on the community nurse as well as um, the, the patient themselves. 
And so there we have all sorts of things there, uh, uh, management reporting. But one of the interesting things about this um, tool as well is it um, is the wound management. I don't know if um, oh, I know some health people, but basically the whole idea is that a wound, um, unless you know what it did yesterday, it might be a different person. You actually need to see whether um, the infection is actually spreading, or whether it's uh, or healing, um, or whether it's healing. And you can actually look at different part, um, aspects of this and the whole history of wound, and if the dressings are actually making um, a difference. I think this is a really important area. And for those mobile, you know. Tech um, for the mobile people amongst you, the communications, of course, this is a lot of mobile based uh, devices um, and it's on an Android uh, mobile or tablet, the whole thing, and so the and works with the GPS and location. So it uses a lot of mobile technology to actually deliver a proper uh, health service. But telehealth is where Docobo really started. It actually started in 2001 and I think Paul will be interested in this. It sort of came from uh, um, an EU project, one of the um, frame, uh, Framework 5 I think it was. So um, it goes back in one of the, and they still use it as an example of commercialization, one of the few successful commercializations of an EU project. And, um, and obviously we got many years in EU projects here. But useful, I thought, to give you some definitions. We hear telehealth, and the other things we actually hear are uh, telecare and telemedicine. These might not, not be the exact definitions, but these are my definitions, so when I use those today, this is what it means. Telehealth is about the physiological activity, it's about the, the person, so it's um, vital signs and particularly lifestyle um, and symptomatic um, conditions as well, and monitored on a regular basis. Telecare, the most um, well-known part of that is somebody has a pendant alarm in their house. It's about the physical activity. It's remote monitoring their activity. Are they actually moving, um, even forward detection, a whole lot of, are they doing things to actually, if they've, if they've got, had a hip operation, are they getting sufficient movement, for example? And then telemedicine. Um, telemedicine is often used in the context of all the others, but it's not really correct from, from that perspective. This is this whole idea of remote two-way consultation with the clinician, the whole video uh, medicine type of aspect. So, telehealth, that's what really what one of our fortes is about. As I say, the uh, monitoring the vital signs and lifestyle, um, as the, frequently as the patient's conditions require. But importantly, it's not just monitoring the blood pressure or anything like that. It's, it's the lifestyle thing. It's about their whole symptomatic conditions, even simple things like, uh, you know, um, have, how did you sleep today? All of those things that, that the doctor might actually ask you, seemingly conversational, but they all fall apart of a patient record and the, um, um, and the ultimate aim is to allow patients to manage their own condition so obviously in the end improving their outcomes and remote management does enable the clinician to actually see early by looking at trends rather than specific points um, of a particular day what where a condition might be deteriorating or was it improving or saying the same one of, one of the things is when people have their blood pressure, that go, you know, you have white coat syndrome. I'm sure you've heard of that. When you go and have your blood pressure monitored, and what happens? It goes sky high because the doctor's actually doing it. But every other day, it's probably fine. And there's a lot of things that if you're doing it yourself in the, um, in the comfort of your own home, you get a much, on a day to day basis, you get a much better picture of a person's condition. So, as a system uh, overview, Key to the um, centre point is the secure clinical database. This is where all the data records are actually stored. But the, for the telehealth system can have different patients with different conditions. In the little um, cartoon there, you know, we've got uh, a heart condition. Is it taking your medication? Um, is it somebody with uh, breathing difficulties? 
every a clinician can actually look after a whole load of different pa uh, patients, all with different conditions, all using the same sort of uh, technology. And basically, this uh, clinician can actually look in remotely to um, to actually see what the patient is actually doing. The clinician is often the community matron in a practice, so this is a an important aspect of it. And I don't know how. Um, there's the long-term care uh, um, condition triangle um, is often referred to. Um, this is about care. Um, different degrees of of uh, conditions, and um, off the really the the level three at the top there. Shall I say? There's only really very few patients actually have. This is means people that have comorbidities. That means lots of different conditions. There's probably very few um, of a whole caseload that have all of those, but. Then you have high risk patients with different um, with different conditions, but not maybe not need as much care as the uh, top one. And then there's people with stand what I call long term conditions. Unfortunately, you start getting condition long term conditions are probably in your 50s. You know whether it's uh, um, everything from varicose veins or whatever it might be. We start actually getting uh, various things in our life. A lot earlier on than, than than everybody thinks is just for the elderly, although actually the EU definition or age UK is from um, if you're over 50 you're elderly nowadays. But you know that's uh, <laughs> another uh, factor of it. And so what you actually uh, what you're aiming to do uh, what you're aiming to do is to help people to go from the top of the triangle, which is highly expensive and highly complex, move them down the triangle to sort of um, where, which are where people can actually manage their own condition. And this is actually part of the whole telehealth uh, process to actually help move them, improve their, uh, and just by managing their condition to actually uh, just make them feel better about themselves. And Telehealth is a, a, the thing, it supports the care delivery but doesn't do the care. But it does give you this whole regular collection of information from the home, vital signs. You take them yourself or your partner, whoever, can actually help you do them. But the main thing is that it's if you do them yourself, you know what, um, what you did the day before. It's trying to get people thinking about it, self-management. But when we talk about delivering the telehealth, or systems, we actually have to think uh, what is the patient's condition, when it's going to benefit, but also how activated and how IT literate as, uh, as they are. It's not necessarily for everybody and so more and more, uh, find more and more people are, are IT literate, but you get to the point where you can't be bothered. And so you have to think about make uh, the solutions to suit the people. This is not about technology, this is about the uh, people. And so the identification of what's actually needed, risk stratification, this patient activation measurement and IT capability. So you need to think about this and as a measure used um, it basically says about the patient, is the patient able to, to support themselves, um, are they, you know, uh, make the um, maintain their health and actually are they able to stay the course of the patient because some people do drop out so all these things are a, an assessment really just enabled by talking to a patient is, um, and the clinicians as to whether these sort of things will be suitable for them and so and so basically you have different ability, good IT skills down to no IT skills all of these things all of these things are taken into account to talk, break it down to what Docobo actually um, do, we actually have you know, quite a, a complex system for um, for the called the Doc at Home. This is our prime product for um, telehealth, and the whole it does enable individual care plans to be done for all the individual patients. That's the important thing. It's all about individuals, and so you can have a care plan set up. There's notes. Um, education, all sorts of things tailored to the needs of the patient. 
and for that reason there's a whole lot of uh, different devices which um, which we deliver them to there's everything from the complex uh, care portal and health hub which I'll talk about more in a minute which I've actually got some uh, oh there they are some sa some some samples for you to uh, well the work bits for you to look at um, and tablets and, and simple telehealth type um, capability which can be delivered um, a URL can come to your phone where you can answer some questions about symptomatic um, questions if you don't need some of the uh, medical device aspects of the care of the um, of the care portal or health hub importantly um, you've got going able to go from right the way through from sort of case management from wellness to illness and you go from the you're aiming to go from the um, IT literate to the IT technophobe you have to support the person with, and try to find a solution to actually suit them and there's all sorts of different per, uh, peripherals down here is the little um, is that the cursor coming out when I point that's okay yeah so so as a result as I say different things to suit different people which is very important because um, a lot of the people I know um, you know if you gave them an iPhone and said, oh, there you are, there you are, my dear, I'll just, just, um, um, you know, that's some 85-year-old lady, some would say, oh, great, yes, it's an iPhone, I would say, oh, I can't even see it. You have to think about all of these particular things when everybody says, I'll have a health app on my iPhone. The first product that actually came from uh, Docabo, which is still out there, was the Health Hub. You can actually see it's a monochrome screen there and it has buttons and the little pads on the side here which you can uh, see are actually they are ECG pads and you can take um, a lead one ECG but it's deliberately done with um, buttons for haptic feedback a monochrome screen for people with impaired vision and when we first designed this we had all sorts of different shapes and wooden blocks to actually uh, um, and got um, uh, got people to come into a local cafe and said uh, come and have a cup of coffee and see what you think of this so involve the people right from the outset and this is a very important facet of it and then um, through one um, as a result of one of the um, uh, technology strategy boards uh, projects collaborative projects which I'm going to talk more about we then came up um, with a sort of later type of concept which is actually um, based, uh, same idea it's still got the ECG pads but it actually uses um, Android uh, operating system closed Android because of the security it's still a medical device it's important that you have to understand the um, security aspects of it and then so this is a class 2a medical device but it's it's designed to give older or less capable pe um, people to still be able to access not just health but potentially other services as well by making the f use of the full richness of the uh, the Android solution just wanted to sort of show some of the ECG type variations and stuff that you can um, do the, the system will actually enable you to um, make measurements of a PQR um, ECG um, so it does all um, it does an assessment and actually measurements against all the various criteria and heart rate variation and so what the clinician sees when they log in to the to their screen we sort of fixed they can fix or um, secure um, sort of mobile access depending on where they are they, they see a build-up of all of the various um, symptoms and so we have uh, these are the physiological conditions you see here heart rate from ECG um, this is the ECG trace say on a particular day and so what you see here for example this is the latest reading on that day and this is and the cursor can actually run along and make comparisons but here is a really important part of it this part down the bottom these are the responses to such questions are as how dizzy do you feel today say on a scale of one to ten or 
do you feel better today? I'm, I'm feel worse that or just different nested questions, all sorts of symptomatic questions, which are actually really quite um, important. And some of the um, less um, pleasant ones, what's the colour of your sputum? You know, um, for those that um, there's. But generally, all of these things are um, then coded from from the response into various ranges of colours and. They're generally four type uh, colours. Um, instead of um, yellow is normal for you, because if somebody improves, there's a lot of systems just have you know, green, amber, red, but if somebody improves, if your yellow is your normal and you have a long-term condition and you get to, how can you show if somebody's in getting better? And so green is normal um, sort of symptoms and then other um, so all the other colours there. So the clinician can immediately see in a few seconds the complete picture of that person and then a build up over a particular month. It's all about trends. And so, and also on the care portal, the ability to um, put, have a, um, it's got a, um, a camera up here for um, video type uh, messaging to talk to your clinician and um, education. One of the things that um, we've done, which has always found, is that the patient can look at their four-week display. The clinician can look at it, but the patient can actually look at it. I spoke to real patients who said, um, how do I, I'm always worried that I've done it right. And I say, um, you know, had my, I've put it in right. They're always worried, you know, the, uh, the mistake. And I just say, well, don't you look at the four-week display? Unfortunately, the health authority hadn't told them about the fact that they could actually look to see what what they'd actually put in to, um, and also to see the trends themselves as part of the management. If they don't want to do that, that's fine, but um, it's important to give people the option. But as I say, it's more than just the telehealth here, as the complex there. Um, it's about independence, social isolation, fragmented families, all of those things have a real effect on people's health and well-being. And the sort of support for daily living, sort of soft assistance area. And I'm just going to touch upon now part of the, a, a project or combination of projects which were carried out under the, um, the Technology Strategy Board, which I mentioned earlier. This is a, a UK um, non-government, government-funded organisation that provides um, funding for various collaborative projects against various calls. This was done under the Assisted Living Innovation Platform. And this has actually helped us to uh, um, this peace and peace anywhere is the project. If I could remember what all the uh, what the acronyms were, um, those of you that have ever worked in um, for um, projects, you uh, you spend hours thinking up a name and then try to work out what the um, um, acronyms are later. This is uh, always the way. It was um, something with pervasive care. It might actually, I think. Um, Pers there we go, personal care environment anywhere at any time. It always uh, fosters me that one. But this is done with um, uh, ourselves. It had four health pe um, groups, or Solent NHS Trust, Age UK from a, um, a long term condition, elderly um, group, Halvar Howl and Carmarthenshire, and, um, and um, then we had Glenside Hospital, who are the spinal and neurological unit, and then our other technical partner was. Um, HW Comms who are up in Lancaster and um, and the, the aims of the project really was to, to bring together these different aspects you've got um, telecare services social care telehealth and health care and bring in the whole community services to actually bring them together so that the user has, um, doesn't have to think about that these are all separate domains. One of the problems is that you can't talk to each other. Everybody lives in a, a separate world in, the U, in England particularly between health and social care and the IT. And the whole idea is to, the, to bring together all these services um, in, in the, the one-stop shop. So what we're trying to do is to use the care portal as a way of delivering a range of services, not just health. So for that we've looked at going from beyond his telehealth, we've all saw that before, um, the health hub and dock at home there, 
with the telehealth service in provisioning and, and adding the ability then for the mobile and now adding some things thinking about location and environmental controls interface on the care portal but then being able to bring in other services we have things called be, the be together services which are the social contact and the um, and the ability for say local community groups if they so desired could set up could um, run a little um, application on a particular area of our service so we host some services for uh, these um, say local age UK groups and then you have um, concierge, the concierge at home. This sort of this is a, the assistance service, the soft assistance, different from telecare, but you know your local volunteer groups. And then the ability also to have um, de um, meals delivered, Meals on Wheels. Whole idea is to bring those together. All of those are effectively different IT secure domains, and we have to worry about all that sort of stuff. But the, but what you don't want is the uh, the um, elderly lady who to have to worry about. Um, what's my secure password for all those things you're trying to present it as a one-stop shop so to take away all that um, complexity and um, so using whatever um, whether it's a tablet or PC we've done it most recently with them um, using uh, the TV as well so we can actually produce our sort of um, output exactly on, onto a larger screen as uh, there and again, looking at the whole wellness to uh, illness type of arrangement, but it's bringing other services, social inclusion services together, which is absolutely key. And I talked about the barriers between um, the IT um, side of her things. So it's a bit small, uh, I don't know what it looks like on the screen. Some important things on here. We um, Docopo are um, N3 approved, which means we, we approve by the, from a security point of view and um, for an um, N3 um, network. But um, and obviously, the local government or um, council have their own gov dot gov uh, nets uh, as well. And so, what we've tried to do is to find points of interoperability by working with partners, where information, which is um, very useful to both, the, say, the community alarm centre and the health centre from different domains can actually be brought together. One of the um, areas, so we've got two um, particular partners, Time Tech, who do a lot of the uh, telecare type systems and activity in the home, John Tech, who run a community alarms um, service. They've, they've got a lot, um, a lot, a lot of uh, entry into the market at the moment. So working together, the whole idea is that if somebody falls at the moment, they're not even allowed to share that information with the clinician. This is the stupid thing about, in England this is, things are gradually changing, but they, in England in particular, there's this whole idea that, you know, where the social care community nurses and the social um, care people will sit in the same office all they can actually do at the moment is one can show them the screen of the other one or maybe a screen print they know a sort of official way of doing this unless you have go through about two years of lawyers doing information governments and information sharing agreements it's a whole torturous arrangement it's all about security but sometimes um, the obvious thing that the clinician likes to know have they fallen over is sometimes hidden and um, so somebody could fall over 12 times. Of course, when the nurse goes round to see that person, how are you feeling? I'm all right, my dear, I've been fine. And you don't get some of that vital information, which may um, link to the wrong medication and all that sort of thing. Similarly, the records aren't shared. So there's a sort of a move. The system now, once the government is in place, allows that sort of records to be shown and displayed on the, on the health record and some information, vice versa, um, all by it through, you know, as I say, all in an approved way, but um, it's vital that all this stuff is shared to get the full holistic picture for that person. And then we've added into the whole um, equation the um, environmental control. Temperature is very important in the house, being able to control the temperature and other, are the windows closed, or if you're putting heating on, all those sort of things. And, and also for um, um, people with dementia, you know, um, 
little alerts to actually um, say that, oh, I, I, do you really want to go outside? You can do it with a voice as well. So bringing together all of that into this holistic view of health, integrated health and care. And so, but delivering the vision, I've, I mean, I've talked about the health and social care side, and I know we've got a, a mi mixed group of people, so I'm going to just talk about some of the connectivity. My, I, my, my background is both telecoms uh, side, and I've done health and assisted living for many years, so I have a sort of crossover. So, but I have to, th I have to think about some of these um, aspects because, you know, connectivity is the key. And so, as a system provider from, uh, from us, that when you start having multimedia services, that what sort of uh, connectivity you actually have in a person's house becomes really important. You know, you can't, um, the simple, oh, sorry, the basic telehealth is done on, few, um, on a few bits of data, it, the data itself, because it's all compressed into a record um, at site. And for example, the, you'll see the health hub on the table there, that's got a GPRS connection within it, and that's perfectly uh, fine. We started off with a telephone. All the health authorities wanted the telephone. They didn't trust this nasty wireless stuff. But then um, Ofcom allowed some of the other talk talk and all um, everybody else to come in without um, maintaining the sort of the standards that BT had actually previously set. And all of a sudden, overnight, um, the systems didn't work. Your stuff is broken was the uh, the answer. But oh dear, they sort of were, didn't have to support any of the data that had actually been used. So. We all went for um, the wireless standards, i.e. GSM, GPRS. But more and more, with all these sort of things like video consultation, social inclusion, everybody says, oh, you've got to have Skype. Huge security issues besides that. But we know if we use Skype, how variable it is. Even now Microsoft have bought it. But uh, um, it's still extremely variable and depends upon the time of the day and everything else. And that's fine for the likes of us. But if you're talking about an elderly lady and it, and, um, and, and it doesn't work, um, oh dear. And so we've got more and more of a broadband connection. But then we still have to maintain the secure data connection then across multiple different networks. And these are also things we have to really care about. We may have to maintain our N3 connection for the, uh, for the clinician as well as being provided. But everybody wants it on their mobile phone so you have secure web access from outside. All of those things have to be taken care about, as I say. And Skype isn't allowed on most NHS networks or they run a separate network because of the security contents. And also, Age UK, for example, don't like... Um, that the person receiving all the Russian spam, you know, <laughs> which we get uh, on Skype. But um, so we must have a, but trying to maintain a reliable connection across any network type, say to an assistance centre, is really a really difficulty in telecare nowadays, and um, and maintaining statutory requirements. And for the uh, for the telecoms people, um, notice that all of these are uplink services, all these services, most of them. And all our technology, 3G technology, is biased towards, uh, um, is asymmetric and biased towards downlink. So you've got critical uplink services on reduced bandwidth. And so it's uh, there. And of course we have all these separation agreements, location. Another thing is that positioning, indoor positioning, people use Wi-Fi, all that sort of thing. But if you want a seamless connection, you go outside and you start using... Uh, GPS and 3G, all sorts of different things, and the mechanism by which you find location has to seamlessly change as well. All of those things are there. And let's say any service that's inconsistent due to the ver uh, variability of the connection, your equipment is broken. Never mind the fact that it's their, their really poor broadband connection or somebody streaming this, that, and the other there. So when we're looking at actually Nowadays, there's not much difference now. We gradually move from telehealth, telecare, but home automation, um, which is a lot of there, the, the very much a bringing together of all these different services. And more and more, I've been doing, uh, I've done a lot of this in the past with smart metering. 
and more and more if there's a smart meter in sort of a link to somewhere that's a whole different secure domain as well so you've got all these different wireless conditions all, all there all running in your home and so interference all those sort of things all has to be taken care, um, uh, care of in how you actually deploy the system and they're all different security resilience requirements I had this um, I'm sorry for those that are health and social care but you know that not to there but as I say good old 2G GPRS machine to machine telehealth record um, fine um, sufficient and then we have fixed line broadband and then um, we've got the 3G sort of mobile social inclusion more people 3G broadband and um, and they start to have small cell those those small 3G base stations the um, femto cells as they're also known but all of a sudden we've got this everybody's how many if you've all heard of 4G there's enough press you know for LTE um, I won't go into that because we've got experts in the room the um, um, the fact is that um, everybody um, there's all sorts of new services um, about LTE in different frequency bands um, as well so when you're thinking about making equipment how do you actually make the best of all these um, different networks that are actually there can you get priority and can you get preemption some of the things you might want for emergency uh, systems some of those are in the specifications but they're probably about four, four or five versions uh, onwards these are quite important aspects of it another project that we actually did from the technology strategy board was actually quite interesting when, when I talk about small cells is that um, we used a um, a small cell femto cell in a, in a rural village in fact it's at the top of a hill, uh, hill when, with links back with satellite mm -hmm. broadband my, my first memory of coming here is seeing the big satellite dish that was, um, um, that's out, out the back here from uh, um, using all this, the satellite and then via the internet um, via Germany back to the UK so in this particular link we actually had um, a what a sort of Wi-Fi to 3G to satellite to uh, back to the internet in Germany then back to our system and remarkably with all that it worked but it does mean that all of a sudden you can start to look at deployments around the world through other technology as well it's important that health and technology can very much go together but if you actually know these things are there so in the um, next generation networks is what we call all these different um, uh, communications bases I know there's some experts here and all that as well but new stuff comes out you know everybody here's my fi uh, 4G phone you've got um, various people I've got a 5G um, um, sort of lab somewhere in um, Surrey University 5G lab and and um, I want my, late, uh, my latest phone uh, there and all the others will be coming out with, with their 4G but to get a medical device through the system it takes two years it can take with the whole design the technique so every time you try and change a, te um, a technology anything like of that nature you're going to um, you're saying okay I've got to requalify this or part of this every time you want to make a change and when people and one of the wor um, things even a simple thing like broadband SMEs like us can't actually buy so even a, a, an ADSL broadband modem because unless you want to buy a quantity of a million nowadays nobody's actually um, interested this is a real problem for anybody that wants to use such equipment not in a highly expensive iPhone but making stuff where you actually down to working to a you know a budget or you know being expensive because it's a medical device and then um, one of the things that you know um, more and more people like um, O2 they've moved their what was their GSM network and their 2G GPRS network over to 3G to give more capacity to support all these devices and so for us to move into 3G and take and use 3G broadband actually 
the price of a modem compared with a 2G modem to fit in there with a 3G is something like six to ten times you know we've ten pounds up to a hundred pounds eighty to a hundred pounds which has an, an impact just buying the components ourselves and um, one of the interesting things is that how, how many of you remember when 3G first came out ten years ago almost almost in the dim distant past but it's only probably last year the year before that they actually produced a modem or the device a similar phone without in other words the phone without all the display the modem for those that aren't sorry technical uh, group here to actually go to fit in other units two years it's sort of like two years ago and so the whole industry sort of lags behind the phone industry and the network and there are and every band frequency band you have to have something different and there are some 44 different bands now around the world instead of five uh, 3G bands and but the holistic view one of the things that um, I sort of um, looked at very worried about everybody's assumed that the network the three the cellular network the 3G network is just going to be there for everybody but all of a sudden there are probably some it might have put 28 million smart meters that's a meter in the home but if you have water and gas there could be 60 million smart meters all wanting to connect somewhere then you have um, connected car. Everybody wants to uh, talk about we have these services. 33 million connected cars, and uh, and and they say maybe you know 15 million health devices is what they're talking about. People with telehealth and everything else. And there are lots of legacy GSM devices that everybody for, almost forgets about that are buried in the ground. And this is a, quite a concern that we move ahead so far for all this fantastic new technology not actually thinking about what the impact of all these things are on a limited resource both in spectrum and network itself and so already this this is having an impact if 2g to 3g there and i put that in for the say basically 3g is not really the best um, technology for uh, for for sort of low packet size it's very wasteful but this is all about technology and I said the key thing for us is asking the customer and the piece a major part of our peace and peace anywhere project was all the focus groups we um, over throughout the project we have different groups and I'm just a couple of pictures and a little film just to sort of show you what they're there and we went up to Leeds with the Age UK headquarters group and this this lady here um, she actually had said um, had never used um, seen a computer she's 82 and basically she's um, at the end of it having tried the you see our uh, care portal she said it's great I've used the computer for the first time so she saw that as a really major achievement and um, this this group was very interesting because it was run over two days and they had the same originally they were going to be a different group and I said oh can we come back tomorrow they had a new group and then the previous lot actually showed the new lot how to you how to use the equipment and that was really good the fact that we, we just stepped back and uh, and that was it just to see how they used it and um, at the same time we d um, I was doing um, a group with um, our existing patients that were used to the health hub which is a small one to see how they reacted to the um, COPD patients um, to the new system and they were filling the questionnaires and everything else and that was very, very revealing these are people that get used to carrying oxygen cylinders around managing their own conditions and getting feedback from the real user is really important and then we have um, um, then we have Bridie and hopefully this might all start up
they'd brought out this dock at home, whatever, and they thought I might be a good uh, candidate to try it out. And um, being on my own as well, living on my own, it was a great thing not just for me because it gave me confidence. Once I, they taught me, it's a simple little, I thought I was never going to use a computer. This is a tiny little computer thing. <laughs> uh, and it's simple, they showed me how to work it. I have to give them information every day. I press the buttons and it asks me questions about my condition. I'm not um, computer uh, orientated really. And I thought, oh, this little gadget called a dock home it is. And um, it really is what it says. It's a little doctor at home. It's all self-explanatory, as it were. You know, it asks you a question and you push a button to give that answer, which I thought, yeah, that's just about my mark. I can do that. At first I thought, oh, I don't even, I can't even text. I don't want to be using a machine. Not only that, using it, but you're thinking about, am I going to be able to do that every day? You know, keep up with it. It's no problem at all. It's, they came, they showed me what to do. They keep in touch with me to make sure I was able to do it. And I, I don't, I'm the one that said, no, don't come out, I'm fine. It's so simple. And Jack was able to talk me through it. And a couple of times he said, now you do it for me. And like a lot of things, once you've handled it yourself, it becomes that much easier. I feel much closer to my nurses now, because if I have a problem, um, then it, I can put it onto the docker boat, and if I don't hear from them from a couple of days, I can ring them, and they will tell me either to take me, me, me medicine or not. It gives you confidence because you're not on your own. You're not and you can talk to people that know exactly what's wrong with you and um, they're right there for to get in touch with you. It helped, gave him a little bit of confidence because he felt that after he'd made a few sort of um, calls on it, somebody phoned him and he was able to talk to them. And I think it's good because whenever you know what's wrong with you and you know what to expect, it's half the battle. He would pick up that little gadget and uh, press a few buttons and he could get some help. And so therefore I wouldn't sort of be too wary about leaving him on his own. <laughs> the only thing that's, that would be useful on it, thinking now, as I'm here amongst it all, would be if there was some sort of panic button on there so that if I'm having a bad attack and I don't want to wait until it all goes through the machinery the other end. I could push a button and somebody would answer the phone. If they upgraded the machine, if they could add that, where you can just phone either the COPD people that you're dealing with or your own doctor and nurse. If other people are offered this, I think they should go for it because it is very useful. Yes, if you get offered any help, with gadgets and things like that, grasp it because it can do no, no harm, only good. I'm glad I have this and it's been a great help to me and I'm very grateful to everybody that helps me with my condition. But one, one thing interesting, they raised the point about the panic button there and, and we always try to get feedback in these things and of course one of the uh, things about telehealth is that we set alerts for all these conditions, really trends give you the best idea. You can set alerts on any condition, I feel ill can raise an alert, so you get help is what they were talking about. But the, the panic button, of course, they're a whole statutory minefield of going through the whole telecare system as well because in the, at the current way it's organized you couldn't rely upon the community matron actually being at the other end you have an alert but not to get an instant response the technology is there but whether the systems will actually support that that's a very interesting point about as to whether um, 
uh, whether the community alarm centres, all those sort of things. So some interesting points came out of that, which we were sort of wrestling with as to what we should what we should provide, or whether anybody will actually answer the call. This is the thing. But one thing to finish off with, really, the mm. business model <laughs> for all of this that who pays because. One of the um, issues has been, obviously, there's still a strong cultural belief everything is provided free at the point of delivery, but when you have social type services, some local authority services are free, but others are paid for by the um, customer, and that's the status quo. So when you have community and social inclusion, uh, s um, digital services, is it actually um, health? or welfare, free at the point of delivery or, um, or paid for. And it's actually very interesting the fact that um, the uh, Southampton, Solon NHS, we had a workshop with them and they had to work, um, and they were really interested in offering all these services but they had to work out what the scope of the services that they offered for free was and what new if they were related to health would be. Very difficult to um, uh, discussion to actually have so this is there and for us if um, at the moment the monitoring costs are included in the daily monitoring cost to the P to ZT but if somebody starts wanting to um, do streaming iPlayer and looking at um, all of a sudden and we start ending up paying the bill for uh, a 3G broadband service then obviously those are things to consider as well and um, you know who owns the customer and whose fault is it goes wrong. So when we look at the one-stop shop, obviously I've written a sort of a, me um, a revenue model and this is the, the whole thing that somewhere along the line all the, all the revenue has got to be either shared out with all these people or somebody pays and it, whilst everybody thinks that Bupa is obviously um, you know, private health, actually it's insurance and, um, and it's still really the same. You've either paid it directly, you've paid it indirectly and the, the whole model is very similar and so you uh, put it there, the, the cost and so all those little arrows on there sort of represent things you have to think about if you have revenue sharing and everything else. It's all possible, it's all doable but there's a lot, um, but there's a lot of thought that has to go into this whole um, stream and the way how payment is actually taken because obviously it's the user is at the top of the triangle the, the, there who's actually paying or an authority. So to conclude really my uh, this evening, the Peace and Peace Anywhere projects were what built, uh, helped us build the uh, care portal, helped us do the integration with all that. It really demonstrated that integrated care services are possible. We can do it, we've got the collaborations to do it, there's a willingness to do it and we've developed real products that are now in our portfolio. Some projects, of uh, collaborative projects for all these things, you know, you know, EU projects particularly often don't produce real things out of it but we've really produced stuff which is out of our the portfolio but Right from the start, we've involved the uh, the uh, our end user, the patient, the client, and and this is, brings an enthusiastic response by people actually thinking they're part of the process because we've done it there. But interestingly, when we try to bring Appetito and Wiltshire Farm Foods, all those sort of things, into the project to actually say, here's your opportunity, you know, captive market. Here's an opportunity to sell all your services it's really difficult, um, nobody's, um, they don't want to know, it's the complexity of being, a, which is surprising, you know, you're actually offering them a route to market, but um, this has quite a di been a difficulty for us. So really, who pays how and to whom is still the greatest consideration for this whole integrated care services, but we are getting there. So thank you. <laughs>